welcome, welcome. I'm Elise Wiggins, I'm the executive chef of Panzano's, and today we're gonna do tortellini, AKA Venus's navel. And you're gonna be like, what? What is Venus's navel? Well, it's the true name that they actually call the tortellini in Bologna. And there's a great romantic kind of sexy story that goes along with it. And I'm gonna tell you that in just a few minutes. Um, so we're gonna come over here to the ingredients and then I'm gonna tell you the story, but I'd like to introduce you my little assistant today. Amy, come over here real quick. This is Amy, she's gonna be helping me today. She's actually one of my pastry chefs over at Penzano's. And so you'll be seeing Amy pop in and out. Thank you so much, Amy. Sure. So actually let's talk about the, um, the tortellini, Venus's navel. Back in the day of the gods in Bologna, in Italy, all of the gods loved to hang out after all of the mortals went to sleep. So all the mortals would eat out, just imagine back then during the time of the gods, they would eat on a tavola outside, a big table, okay? And they would drink all the wine and they would eat all of their food and then they would retire inside to clean up the mess the next day. But this is when the gods loved to come down to the earth and actually eat all of the leftover food and drink all the wine. Now there's three particular gods that love to hang out together. Venus, who is the goddess of love, but also the most beautiful woman ever to exist. Perfect. Then there was Bacchus, and we all know who Bacchus is. He's the party favorite guy. He brings all of the wine, okay? So there's lovely, beautiful woman and the party favorite guy with the wine. And then there's Mars, this hot, fiery guy that loves to like fight and have war and everything like that. So imagine the three of them that love to hang out together. So the three of them would come down and descend down to the earth when all the mortals had like gone to bed and then they would eat all of the wine or eat all the food and then drink all of the wine. And then here's the, the PG-13 part. The three of them would make love. And then just before dawn, they would ascend back to the heavens so the mortals wouldn't see them. Well, one night Venus drank way too much and passed out in a meadow in all of her naked glory. All right, so the cook walks into the meadow and finds Venus. Venus, the most perfect woman ever. Beautiful, naked. He was so struck on how beautiful she was that he quickly ran into the kitchen to create a pasta to immortalize her beauty, which was the shape of her navel. So if you look at the tortellini closely, on one side it looks like an innie, and on the other side it looks like an Audi. <laughs> but anyway, so let's, let's start here. Okay, so we're gonna start off with the dough first, okay? And uh, one thing that's important about the dough, I'm gonna tell you a little trick. Um, a little tip is that you always want to make your pasta dough and I really recommend you letting it sit overnight. One, it gets a lot of work out of the way and then it's ready for you the next day. But the whole point behind that is the absorption and the relaxation of the pasta. Because pasta, when you use a, a, a flour that has gluten in it, you're literally working out the gluten and you want that. Okay, when you actually stretch pasta dough, you're creating gluten, you're activating the glutens, which is just like when we work out. When we work out, we like to tighten our glutes, right? Everything is good, nice and tight. But we also need to relax. So, you know, sometimes after we work out, we need like an hour or two for our muscles to relax. Don't they feel really tight after you've, you know, kneaded them together? The same thing happens to pasta. And so technically you could do one to two hours, but I really recommend that you do it overnight. That way it's ready, nice, soft, and supple. Um, so the ingredients here, we just do, this is a zero, zero flour, okay? And it's actually a really fine grind flour. When they refer to zero, zero, they're literally referring to the stone that comes down and actually mills the flour down, the grains, and it mills it so fine that it's nice and tender and the absorption of the liquid is faster, okay? And that makes more of a tender pasta. Italians love that. So that's why you always want, want to try and get a zero, zero, but you can use the all-purpose flour as well. And then this lovely color that you have right here also is the semolina. Notice that it's darker and yellow in color. It's a winter wheat pasta, so it's much more durable. Whenever you're doing a stuffed pasta, you actually need to combine the two, okay? A supple pasta that's nice and flexible, and then also a flour that gives you strength, okay? Because we're stuffing something. We want it to be flexible to give, but we also want it to have strength to hold the ingredients on the inside. And that's why if you actually look at this color and it looks familiar, um, think about all the penne pasta and the dried pasta you get in the grocery store. It looks just like this, nice and gold colored because that is actually what it's made out of, 100% semolina. And what they do in Italy and, and actually in the States here when we make pasta out of this or dried pasta is that they mix this with water and that's it. And then they bake them, they create their pastas and they bake them in these huge ovens and sometimes up for three days to completely remove all of the moisture. 
And so that's where you get nice dried pasta. And that's also why it takes a couple of um, minutes, sometimes seven to 15, depending on the, the pasta that you're cooking. That's why it takes longer to cook. But we're actually making fresh pasta here, so that actually cooks very quickly. I'm just gonna combine the two together, okay? Where they're nice and blended. And I'm making just a, a traditional pasta dough right here, but I'm not gonna be adding any flavor. If you wanna add black pepper or thyme or saffron, or even if you wanna do, let's say, a Latin flavored one and add some smoked paprika or something, this is your beautiful canvas and you can create whatever flavor that you want to. So now that I created the, uh, the mix this flour all together, I'm gonna to create a little well. And then I'm gonna crack an egg in the middle of the well. All right. And uh, the next thing we're gonna do is actually I'm gonna, so I don't get my hands all dirty, and it's okay if you do this. So then I'm gonna just crack the egg up a little bit, okay? I'm gonna add a little bit of olive oil. Amy, can I get the bottle of water, please? Thank you so much. Of course. And uh, I'm gonna add just a little bit of the water, okay? And you can always add more. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna gently, I'm just stirring in the middle of this well, and I'm gently grabbing all of the flour and incorporating it. So it's not like, and if the water falls out of the well, it's okay. But the, the point behind is that you want to gently incorporate your wet ingredients with your dry. Because this isn't bread. You know, usually with bread, you're like, okay, add this, fold it, push it, turn it. Um, and that's great for bread. But for pasta, we don't want it lumpy. Uh, oatmeal is good lumpy, pasta is not good lumpy. So we just fold all of this in. And uh, see how actually, you know, I have a double action here. I'm moving the bowl and the spoon at the same time. And so you're literally stirring with two different properties. You're using both hands. And then notice how it just comes together much faster. So if I keep it stationary, you're really working hard to incorporate it. So here, you just move both of them at the same time. And then notice also I have a little tilt to the bowl. Um, the tilt keeps all the ingredients down in one section. So even as I move it around together, it binds it. It makes the ingredients drop to the bottom so it's easier to mix together. So now, see how it's coming together in this nice ball? So now I'm gonna take these ingredients and push them together. Now I'm gonna create the, the pasta dough, the nice ball. And then so from here, I have a little bit of extra flour in case, so I'm gonna feel. So notice that like when I squeeze the pasta, it starts to bounce back. And again, that's that gluten I was talking to you about. You wanna activate that, you want it to bounce back because that means the glutens are activated. That means you have strength in your pasta and you want that. The key is, is to later allow it to rest. That way it's nice and supple again. So I'm feeling it and my fingers are sticking to it. You can almost see the little wet dough that's sticking to my fingers right here. And so I always say that the food speaks to you. And right now it's telling me that it's a little wet. So I wanna add just a pinch more flour. And it's always better to just do a little bit at a time and give, as you're working the pasta and in incorporating and activating the glutens, you know, you're gonna allow the flour to have some time to absorb, okay? And already, look at that. It even looks like a softer look. You can even see, it almost has a drier look to it. Um, and as you can see now, it's, I'm not having any stick to my hands, which is beautiful. So I'm just gonna finish incorporating the last bit of flour. And now I'm gonna roll it into a little ball, okay? Now that I have this ball, I'm gonna actually wrap it with plastic. Can I get a little plastic? Thank you, Amy. So, the point behind this is you wanna make sure that there's no air um, trapped inside with your pasta dough. So you just take your plastic, and notice that I just folded it up this way, because now I'm gonna crease around the baby. We'll call this the dough baby. And uh, you want to be gentle with the dough baby, okay, and take care of the baby because she's going to provide us great things later on. And then I go from here and I press the air out, okay? And now I'm just going to wrap it up. And again, let's say you're in a hurry, you want to impress your friends, or you're, you're on this almost future date and you want this person, you want to marry this woman and 
all that kind of good stuff. And you want to whip up some tortellini and tell her the story and then propose to her right then and there. You could do this if you allow this to at least rest for at least two hours at the, on the kitchen counter in your home, okay? So I'm just gonna set this there. And if you're gonna let it rest in your kitchen or say for the next day, pop it into your refrigerator, you're good to go. Just pull it out, allow it to get to room temperature the, the next day, and then you'll find that you're able to, to work it and it's nice and, and supple and lovely, okay? All right, so let's move on to the next part and that is the filling, the ingredients. So let's go over that real quick. We have our dates, okay? And we've removed the little pit that's in the date, so make sure that you do that. We also have a little bit of almond paste, mascarpone, one of the best cheeses ever, and number two or number one equal to mascarpone is grated Parmesan as well. And, uh, and of course, the, the lovely butternut squash. So right now we're gonna get into the butternut squash because we actually need to cook this. So when, when you get these in the grocery store, um, these are, are lovely, but the skins are really hard, okay? And the thing that I love about using butternut squash for this recipe, um, instead of say pumpkin, is because there's a lower moisture content with this. And that means you get more meat. Okay, and that you don't have to, to reduce it or cook it for a long, long time in order to evaporate some of the moisture. If you get the good old American uh, jack-o'-lantern or the pumpkin, it has a high content of water and you'll really have to cook it for a long time. Otherwise, your filling is gonna be very, very watery. Also, one thing I wanna show you is that, um, you know, when you're in the house, um, often people, they're like, oh, I have to use this knife and this thing is so hard and when you cut, uh, the skin of this, you're like, oh, this is just too hard and how can I take it off? Well, believe it or not, even though this is a really hard outer shell, you can peel it very easily. So I'm actually gonna cut the base off, okay? One thing also to know about is that this is solid pumpkin right in here and it's less work too. So imagine if you did the American jack-o'-lantern and you had all of those seeds in there and you had to pull out all the seeds and then the, the meat around the outside is just like this much. That's a lot of work for you to do where if you look at this baby, you're gonna get a lot of reward with very little um, effort. And um, also, golden prize that's in here, all those wonderful seeds, don't throw them out. You pay a lot of money when you go to the grocery store and you buy those seeds that are already pre-cooked for you. They're so simple. And I'm gonna show you too, the squash seeds, um, they're easy to get out. You know, again, I keep poor American jack-o'-lantern, I'm making fun of him today, but um, these seeds, if you watch, they pop out very easily and it doesn't take a whole lot of work. So instead of the American jack-o'-lantern where you reach in there and, and you pull out all of the, the seeds and the guts and everything else like that, um, here with, uh, with these guys, you barely put the spoon in there, okay? And all the seeds pop out. It's very simple. And then also the other side is people have a tendency to say, oh, there's all this goop and I don't wanna have to mess with this. And, and actually it's even better if you um, put the whole thing, even these little connective tissues and stuff like that, put them all on a tray, pour a little olive oil over them and salt and pepper, and then you just bake them. And because this is mainly water, this will actually reduce down to nothing and pull away from the seeds. And then when you're done cooking them in the oven, you'll pull them out and the seeds will be all completely separate. And all you have to do is tilt the skillet. This will stick, the pulp will stick to your, your pan while the seeds will actually pop off. So there's another little trick for you. But save these guys, like that's like, as we say in Louisiana, that's good eating. So don't, don't waste those. And uh, so let's move to this guy. So again, just like I promised, little peeler, okay? Nice and easy. We're gonna take this and then we're gonna cut it down into manageable pieces. Now, you don't have to do it this way, okay? You can actually split this guy in half lengthwise, take your seeds and the pulp and everything out, little olive oil, put it down on the sheet tray, flat side down and roast the whole thing. Then you can scoop all of the squash afterwards and combine it with your ingredients. Um, but the reason why I'm doing it this way is because I like to have, if you look at my ingredients, they're all little tiny little ingredients. The dates are tossed, uh, are diced tiny, the Parmesan is grated, and so what I like to do is I like to have a bite, of a, a little bite of something different as I'm eating. Otherwise, my mouth gets bored. Like, I, I always give credit to the Snickers inventor because like, they have it all going on. Sweet, salty, creamy, crunchy, they've got it all going on. 
And so you're never, you're never bored with that because we're always stimulated with the, the various textures and the various flavors. And so that's what I want to do with this. And now we're just going to slice it down. Another thing is notice how we cut flat. So cutting off a flat side to this will actually help you stabilize what you're, what you're about to cut and it helps you actually cut it more exact. You could be even more safe. If this is too tall for you, and you're worried about that. Lay it down on your side. Now it's nice and flat. And then also when you're cutting, here's another little tip. People, when they cut, they have a tendency to always take their knife and go down like this. What you really want to do is you always want to have your tip onto the board. The other thing is like another tip is that, you know, make sure that you're holding your knife back here. A lot of people when they're in the kitchen and they're, they're not going to culinary school, they, they want to put their finger on the tip of the knife like this. And that's very dangerous because if you put too much pressure, you can flip your knife and cut yourself. This is the proper way of holding the bolster of the knife, holding it this way. That gives you much more control. And I promise you at first you're going to be like, that, that feels very awkward. Um, and it felt awkward for me, it feels awkward for everybody when you first learn. But then you get more control. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take these and cut more sticks out of batons. Okay. And once we have this, we're going to turn it again, keep it even. We're going to cut it same sizes. And this means that you're going to have even flavors. As this cooks, it cooks evenly. You always want to make sure that you are cooking everything as even as possible because otherwise, you know, if you cut too small of a piece, it's going to disintegrate and you want to make sure that you're able to have everything nice and even. Otherwise, you lose the flavor. So you want to make sure that you actually keep all the flavor that's in here. So I have them all spread out on a, on a sheet tray or AKA cookie tray. And we're going to drizzle a little olive oil over them, okay? The olive oil actually helps to um, bring in the heat. It attracts the heat. Also helps to lock in some of the moisture that's in here. We do want to take some of the moisture out, um, but we don't want it to be dry. Um, and so the olive oil actually does that. It, it locks things in, locks the juices in, and um, helps to uh, bring out the concentrate the sugar. So as a little bit of the water does come out, the natural flavors of the squash are going to concentrate and, um, and bloom. So we'll have this beautiful flavor. The other thing also is I'm going to go ahead and sprinkle a little salt. Notice that I'm salting after the olive oil. The olive oil is like your glue. Things won't stick, you know, unless you um, have some kind of a natural food glue. And so now we're going to actually pop this into an oven, 350 degrees. Amy, thank you so much. And um, that's only going to really take seven minutes. And the reason being is that the, the size of the butternut squash is very tiny and um, more surface area is exposed. And so because it is tiny, it actually takes a little bit of uh, amount of time as, com as compared to roasting the whole one. Now for the magic of television, we're actually going to bring this uh, already pre-cooked uh, roasted squash. And as you can see, it's got this, these lovely tiny little bits of concentrated butternut squash. Now we're going to combine everything together. So I'm going to add crumbled, a little bit of crumbled almond paste, okay? And then I'm also going to add the dates that have been diced. And notice that I diced these dates just a little bit smaller than the butternut squash because I just want a hint. Dates are naturally sweet. So I just want a hint, okay? And we're going to ask, uh, put in the, the mascarpone, okay? Mascarpone is actually from the Lombardy region. And believe it or not, this cheese, if you actually inoculated it um, and with a mold and let it age, it turns into gorgonzola, another one of my favorite cheeses. Um, but um, uh, the wonderful thing about the state of uh, mascarpone is, is that when the, the, the cattle are actually uh, up on the grasslands and they're grazing, when they drive the cattle down, okay, so the, the cattle have been eating all these wildflowers and these grasses and everything, and they're getting nice and fat. And then when they, they actually drive them down, it stresses them. And so when it stresses them, okay, they're getting a good workout coming back down to get milked. All of the heavier fat drops down to the bottom of their udders. It is the first milking, um, once they return back to the barns, that is actually used to create um, mascarpone, and it's because it has a high fat content. 
but that is good, okay? So that means it's sweeter, it's richer, it has a, a wonderful flavor, and it makes that wonderful dessert that we all know about, the tiramisu. So, so we've got a little sweet, we've got the savory pumpkin, but it's a slight sweet to it. We have the almond in there, so nutty, and now grated Parmesan, okay? And I'm also gonna add just a, a teeny bit, this Malden salt. It's a English salt, nice flake salt. I love the texture of it. It gives a little bit of crunch. And I'm just going to gently fold it together. I'm not gonna mash this. All that work of grating the cheese and dicing the dates and the butternut squash, I wanna make sure I just gently fold it. Okay, so that's it. The filling is ready. And now we're going to make the Venus's navel. We're going to roll out all this dough, already been nice and rested, and uh, going to cut out round shapes. Okay, so here's this lovely little cutter. All right, I'm going to roll the dough out. Okay, look how soft and supple. Remember what I was talking about? Nice and supple. And then also, when you roll out pasta dough, you can see my pink fingers through here. You want to make sure that when you roll your dough out, you want a thin dough because remember, when the pasta hits the water, it doubles in size. So we just cut out nice little round circles. Okay. And again. So with the tortellini, you fold it twice. Okay. And uh, you know, um, pasta mista, don't throw this away. You can actually cut these into little off um, pieces and throw this in a soup, cut it really fine, throw this in a soup, let it cook in a broth, it's absolutely delicious. So save this, uh, don't throw this away, this is good stuff. Okay, so back to the Venus's navel. All right, so we need a little bit, again, remember I was referring to the glue, so we wanna make sure that we have a little bit of egg wash, okay? So and you don't have to overwork this egg. Once you break it up and stir it up, you just want a combination of the egg white and the egg yolk. Um, but again, you do not have to um, just use one or the other. You can use even just water if you want to. But I like the egg because once the egg cooks in the water, it sets and it's like cement. It really um, adheres to the, um, the pasta. When you're doing a stuffed pasta, refrain from double stuffing, okay? So the diameter that you see right here, okay, you wanna only put a quarter of the size of your, of your either ravioli or of your tortellini. Because otherwise, if anything gets on the edges right here, it's going to do what's called a blowout. It will not seal. Once you put it in the water, it's gonna completely open and all the goodies that you put in here is gonna be floating on the top of the water. Quarter of a size, okay? Just a little bit. Got a little bit of everything in there, right? And then we're gonna fold it. I'm gonna show you when we fold it, I call the move the taco move. All right, so we're going to take a little bit, remember our glue, just a little bit of the egg wash around the outside, okay, all of these. It's gonna help close everything off. So what I do is um, I press down the ingredients just a little bit, all right? And the key, again, is to make sure that there's no air in here. Just like the pasta dough I was showing you earlier, you wanna make sure that there's no air in here because if you trap air in here, what's gonna happen to this? It's gonna float at the top of the water and it's gonna kinda bob because the air pocket's trying to get out, right? And that means there's a portion of this pasta that's gonna be undercooked because it's floating on the, on the top. So you wanna make sure that you actually remove um, all of the air and the way that you do that is through the taco move. Okay, so I keep my finger at the top and then what I do is I gently squeeze around the top of the filling. Okay, and now you can actually see a little air pocket right in here. So I'm going to close around the filling. Okay, I can feel it and when you do this the first time do it slowly. That way you're not rushing and you know that you're doing the right thing. And then notice I didn't squeeze my ingredients. Okay. You can feel it, so just be gentle. That's why I was saying go slow. So it's nice and tight around there, but I still have an opening. That's where all of the air escapes. And so from here, I just pull it closed. 
So now this site has absolutely no air in it. Now we're gonna flip it, same thing, okay? Final move around the filling, okay, nice and slow. I'm not squeezing the filling, nice and slow. And now I'm just closing it, okay? So now we have this. You can eat it just like this. If you end up forgetting these steps, it's okay. The mezzaluna, so half moon, you can go with this right now. Um, but we're gonna go one step further. We're gonna keep going, okay? So now I'm gonna put a little indentation in here to help um, the, 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 the bend, okay? And then notice I put a little glue on the ends as well. Okay, just a little bit. See, now I'm kind of wiping it off because it needs to be sticky. You don't want it to be slick. If your fingers are able to move around it really fast, then it's a little too wet. Now I fold, okay? And press just a little bit. And so, ladies and gentlemen, here's your innie and here's your Audi. okay? Venus is navel. All we need to do now is to move over and we're gonna actually create the, the sauce for it. And we're actually gonna cook our tortellini, our Venus is navel, and we'll be eating very, very soon. And we're gonna talk about actually an ancient Chinese secret. Um, pasta actually was invented um, in Asia. Um, so the Italians took it, but it's okay. We're glad that they did because we love what they do with it. Um, but one of the tricks that they learned is how to prevent um, your pasta water from overflowing. So when you've heard you should add oil to your water to make sure that your pasta doesn't stick together, that doesn't work. Because the little beads, once you put the oil that's in here, one, you only use a little bit, and then two, it ends up floating around the water. And I don't know if you've seen this, but after you pull your pasta out, usually the oil's still in the water. So the real reason behind this is that the little beads of oil that are floating on the top of the water, as the pasta cooks, it releases starch, right? And how many of us have had pasta water that has overflown before? It's probably because um, we actually didn't have any oil on top of the water. Those little beads of oil actually pop the starch bubbles and keep them still in the water. So that's really the only thing it does is actually prevents your pasta water from overflowing. So it's always good to add just a tiny bit of um, oil to it. Don't use your expensive stuff um, because literally it goes nowhere. Um, but just a little bit to prevent the pasta water from overflowing. That's it. And um, another thing also about the, the olive oil, don't put it on there unless you're gonna eat it with just the olive oil because it ends up clogging the pores of your pasta and prevents it from absorbing any of your flavor, your pasta, you see your pomodoro sauce, you know, your Alfredo sauce, any garlic sauce, whatever sauce that you're making, if you actually coat it with olive oil, it, it clogs it up and it's never gonna absorb it. And so it's never gonna be good like, you know, you always have pasta the second day and it's always like so much better the second day. Well, that's because the pasta's actually had time to soak up all the flavors of the herbs and, and uh, all of the tomato sauce or whatever other sauce that you're making. So it's given it an opportunity to do that. So, you know, make sure that you don't uh, use the olive oil for that. Now let's do the, the sauce. We have just a little bit of butter In my restaurant, you know, the, at Panzano's, um, the, the, the kitchen is on display. And uh, there's two different sections. We have the, the sweet section for the sweet people. I'm not there. Um, I'm on the savory side, or the spicy side, I should say. And um, everything's on display so everybody can see us cook. And actually, guests can actually sit up at the counter with us and uh, watch us literally cook right in front of them, almost just like here to me. And um, I always love it when women sit at the counter with us because we'll start to cook something and we'll have a saucepan, you know, and we seat 260 people in Panzano's, so we make large batches of sauces at one time. And the women, when they see me scoop out butter like that and plop it into a pan, the air almost sucks out of the room because they're so afraid that that's their dish. And it's so funny, I'm like, it's okay. I'm feeding like 50 people with this, don't worry, don't worry. And she watches me like a hawk to make sure that I'm not lying to her. So um, anyway, so we've got the butter in here, it's starting to cook down, and fresh rosemary, okay? We love rosemary, right? It's piney, it's got that nice resin, we love rosemary. Get a juniper kind of flavor profile. Um, usually we all, we chop this rosemary up, right? Because we want it finer, because usually it has a funny mouthfeel, it's kind of toothy, and like I said, there's resin that's in here, so it almost, it's almost kind of chewy. Um, it's not really a good mouthfeel, so that's why people often put it in a pomodoro sauce and let it cook for a long time to mellow it out, right? Well, I'm gonna teach you that you can actually cook this in a different way. You can actually fry it, and it removes the resin, infuses the rosemary flavor into the butter, 
and then crisps this so you can actually eat it. It's crunchy and it's delicious like this and it actually mellows out the true needles of the rosemary. It's delicious. So I'm gonna actually throw those in. If you notice, I just went against the grain of the stem and then this last part that pops off easily, that's the tender section of the rosemary. So you can actually throw that in and everything is edible. And then save these guys, here's another tip, save these guys and let's say you're having shrimp that night, it is grill season, it's spring, everybody's outside, I can smell the wood and the charcoal going everywhere throughout all the neighborhoods. Take these, save them, and then soak them in a little bit of water and skewer your scallops or skewer your shrimp with that or even some fish, just put it right through. And uh, as you're cooking it, this will release its oils as well. And you'll be able to have this nice hint of rosemary and whatever you know, protein or even cheese that you're actually cooking. It's absolutely lovely. Um, and if you only have a few of these and you want to get fancy, and let's say you just bought this cheap olive oil to kind of cook with and, and you, some friends come over and surprise, we're here, and you want to have something to, to, to nibble on, just some good old stale bread, toast it in the oven, and then take some of these stems that you have and simmer them in oil and then actually infuse it. And so there you have like this nice fancy kind of uh, infused oil that you just whipped up. So I'm gonna finish putting in the rest of the rosemary here. See all the large bubbles? And remember what I was talking about, that the food speaks to you, okay? So just looking at this right now, the rosemary looks really green and it still looks pretty soft, okay? It's got a soft look to it, soft green. And we're seeing lots of large bubbles, okay? When you look at the large bubbles, that is water escaping quickly out of the rosemary, okay? Once most of the water is evaporated, You'll watch, those little bubbles will become tiny bubbles. And that means most of the water is evaporated and also evaporated from the butter, okay? So there's the butter, the water content that's in the butter, then there's also the, the protein in there, and then we have the ghee remaining, all right? You'll start to see that the butter starts to clear, the, the foamy part will start to subside. And you're gonna see, see how there's tiny bubbles over here in the corner? They're all starting to rise, okay? Part of the resin, the sap that's actually in the rosemary, is kind of binding with a little bit of the moisture now. And so it's creating this foamy, tiny little bubbles, and that too will subside. Notice, once the protein particles actually come to the top, then they'll drop down to the bottom, okay? And this is where this wonderful thing that's called Maillard's reaction happens. It's where the sugars start to turn and concentrate and that's what gives us that dark rich kind of uh, wonderful nutty flavor that actually comes from um, the caramelization the um, the sugars turning we're frying see how stiff this rosemary is now nice and stiff it looks like it's like a fried piece of popcorn where before when i was handling the rosemary right it was nice and soft and kind of feathery and i was able to bend it and even though rosemary is still kind of stiff you know I was still able to bend it. It's nice and crispy now, nice and crispy. And you can actually see that some of the chlorophyll has kind of come out of the, of the rosemary, it's nice and crisp. And that didn't take very long. And the beautiful part too is I wanna to show you, see the brown butter? There, mmm, I heard that. <laughs> Lots of good stuff, you guys know what's in for you, huh? So the brown butter part is ready. And then again, fat attracts fat. The flavor is infused. And so the rosemary actually will take, it will release its flavor. The oils will naturally release as it's cooking in the butter and then bind with the fat of the butter. And then it just literally, the butter is like this vessel that carries all the flavor out. And so it's just beautiful combination between like an, a nutty butter, brown butter sauce and a hint of fresh rosemary, which is gonna go great with these tortellinis. So our sauce is ready. Now we, all we have to do is cook the tortellinis. So I'm just gonna drop them in the water. Also, another little thing that I should have done earlier, salted the water, good amount, sea salt. You want it to be salty. Um, it just adds another flavor, another layer of flavor to your pasta. So you just wanna stir that up, okay? Um, also, if you really wanna take it up a notch and you wanna add some uh, a deeper flavor to this, you can use um, a chicken stock or any kind of uh, broth and actually cook your pasta in that. Because remember I was saying that the pasta is a sponge and so the minute it hits any kind of moisture, it starts to soak it up. And that's why like 
again, Campbell's, I keep referring to all these other people. Campbell's, um, you know, has, when your kids like, you love it because the noodles taste like chicken broth, right? They've been actually cooked in it. So they just have this deeper flavor to them. So if you're able to, if you've got some extra chicken broth and you're like, what am I gonna do? And just throw the pasta in here. Even the, the pasta mista that I was talking about earlier for your soup, just throw it in there and it's just gonna soak up all that flavor. So it's gonna be that much more delicious. So here's the pasta that I made, the dough I made earlier, okay? And it's got this nice yellow um, color to it. And that was what the original pasta dough um, had the color as well. It's the same color. But again, as the pasta cooks, it's going to um, absorb water. So it's gonna lose its color, okay? It's gonna get a little bit blonder in color. And going back to the food speaks to you, if you watch the color, it's gonna tell you you're getting closer and closer. So it gets closer to that kind of a paler, color than this yellow, you know, half of this color, a little bit lighter, you know, then you're gonna know that the, the pasta is getting close. And then also I'm gonna show you a trick to where you actually take the edge of the pasta because, you know, there's always that old adage, if you take the pasta and you throw it up against the wall and it sticks, then it's ready, you know? Well, I don't know about you, but I've done that several times and my mother didn't like it and it never worked. So, so um, take the tortellini or your ravioli or your spaghetti, whatever else you're using, and then take your thumbnail or take a knife and cut it in half, okay? Just cut a little edge from it. I'm gonna show you how we're gonna just tear a little edge from the tortellini. And then when you peek on the inside, if it looks white, there's gonna be a white chalky look to it. Um, if it's underdone, then it's underdone, okay? So then you pop it back in and you continue to cook. The other rule about cooking um, pasta that's stuffed is that Instead of um, a tagliatelle or anything else like that that's just a ribbon pasta, you only have one layer of pasta, not two, to cook. So it cooks faster, right? Well, whenever you have a stuffed pasta, whether it's this or ravioli, um, you're taking two layers of pasta and you're putting them together. So the cooking time is twice, at least. Um, also depends on what you have as far as your filling is concerned and if you double stuffed your ravioli. Um, so you wanna make sure that the interior ingredients are nice and warm as well. Um, so increase the time by two um, if you have a double layer of pasta. And then also, depending on what your ingredients are in there, if you have, say, meat or sausage, you wanna make sure that that's heated up nicely. And so you wanna give it a little bit more time. This is probably one of the only pastas that it's okay to just cook a little bit longer than, say, a ribbon pasta, um, because you can buy time because of the filling that's on the inside. And so you wanna do this as quickly as possible, and I'm sure you will, um, but you'll lift it up, and actually I'm gonna cut it just like that. And actually this is cooked perfectly. Right here, beautiful. So as you can see, there's no white part that's in here. This is um, perfectly al dente and it's ready to go. We're going to put it in this little pan and then we're gonna to toss a little bit of the sauce. Okay, and then we're going to plate. And so from here, I'm gonna add just a little bit of our brown butter, okay? Just to toss, just to toss the pasta and coat it nicely, okay? Nice sheen, because as you can see, the pasta in itself gets a little dull when it's just, uh, just water. So the brown butter gives it a nice little sheen, okay? I'll tell you a funny story as I'm plating this. When I first put this on the menu, I did it during Valentine's Day. And um, I had a cook that was with me um, for a long, long time. And I explained to everybody, okay, this is a tortellini. And I told them the Venus's navel story. And I'm like, so we're gonna put, we have a broth, it's a chicken broth, and we're gonna put the soup of the day. It's gonna be two tortellini in there, symbolizing two people in love. So here's the spec, make sure you send it out like that. And my cook was like, okay, okay. And for a little while he was putting two tortellini in the soup and everything was great and dandy. And then I kept seeing, after that, I kept seeing three tortellini going into the soup. And I was like, Moise, it's two tortellini in, in the soup. And he's like, no, no, it's three. And I was like, are you arguing with the chef, you know? And I'm like, no, it's three, it's two tortellini, symbolizing two people in love. And he was like, Oh, but it's so much better with three. So, <laughs> so I have four tortellini in here. So it all depends on how many tortellini you want in your soup. It's all, I'm not judging. It's whatever you want to do. So here's that nice crunchy rosemary. And then a little bit, I know y'all saw me dump off that huge hunk of butter, but there's a lot that's left in here. 
and you just put a little bit because you don't want too much, okay? Because the fat will actually coat your tongue and prevent you from um, appreciating and absorbing the flavors. Um, it'll be delicious, your first bite will be lovely, but after that it'll get just a little bit dulled out. So just a quick plate clean. And then the final thing that we're gonna do is a little Parmesan and then a little parsley gar garnish. This is Italian flat leaf parsley. I love this parsley because it's so clean and fresh. Um, it's not like the curly parsley. I mean, curly pars parsley is nice, but it kind of tastes like wet grass to me after you, when you eat it. Um, this is actually bright, almost lemony, nice and clean. And because of all the components that we have in here that are pretty rich, we need something to, to really clean the palate a little bit. And the parsley really does that. You know, the, the Romans used to eat parsley and mint to clean their breath. Um, after they'd eat all of these lovely dishes and things like that. So um, we're gonna garnish with a little Italian parsley. And then of course, the grated Parmesan. This is a microplaner, I love this because you can make it snow Parmesan and then not feel all the guilt because it's nice and light. It shaves it nice and thin. And uh, you can just heap on the Parmesan and think that you're being naughty, but you're really being pretty good. Um, but I also like the look, the texture of it. Sometimes you can't see the pasta when you grate too much cheese. And I wanna be able to see that, so just a hint to that. And then of course, leave this on the table because you're gonna want more later on. And, uh, and then again, simple. Less is more, just an accent of color. And notice I just took, I took one leaf and I'm literally tearing some of those off just to give it just a tiny bit of color. And that's it. Odd numbers are best, I find, for, for colors and for, for garnish and stuff like that. And um, this is it. I'm Elise Wiggins, and I'm with Panzanos, and this is my Venus's navel, AKA the, the tortellini. Thank you for joining me. Thank you.